Good morning, and welcome to the worship service of First Congregational Church, St. Albans. My name is the Reverend Jessica Moore. I am joined this morning by Stefan Conradi on piano, Aaron Granger, our music director, Lane McElroy, our videographer. First Congregational Church is a member of the United Church of Christ. We are a welcoming community of believers, seekers, and doubters. And please know that no matter where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here to travel with us. This is our last non-in-person recorded only service. Next Sunday, hooray! Next Sunday, May 2nd, we are meeting outside, right in front of the church in our garden. We meet at our regular time, 10 a.m. But we need your help. To do this the right way, we need the most outgoing, happy people to join us to be greeters, because we still need to do contact tracing. We need to greet our friends we haven't seen in so long. So if you feel confident and secure with COVID and wearing a mask and being distanced and greeting the people coming in, please call me so we can make this as special as we can. We'll all be there greeting each other. <laughs> and I have mislaid my bulletin. Please join me for the morning prayer. Creator God, we declare with joy and trust that our world belongs to you. For the fierce love with which you hold all of your creation, we declare our world belongs to God. For creation's awesome beauty and its bountiful provision, we declare our, our world, world belongs, belongs to God. God. For the tilling and keeping of creation, we declare our, our world, world belongs, belongs to God. God. Our opening hymn this morning is number 38, Morning Has Broken. That's in the Pilgrim Hymnal. in the destruction of the natural world. We have forgotten to care for our neighbor. 
we have gotten your call to us to be stewards of your creation. We have created a situation in which people and the planet suffer from environmental injustice, from a lack of access to clean water, from health impacts of air pollution, from environmental racism that endangers and harms Black, Indigenous, and people of color, from plastic pollution which chokes the ocean. Forgive us, O oh God. Amen. When we list those wrongs, it's hard to think of something that's right. But regardless of what we've done, and we keep trying, we need to be reminded that God walks with us, and God loves you without condition, today and every day. Amen.
<clears throat> God to St. Francis. Frank, you know all about gardens and nature. What in the world is going on down there on the planet? What happened to the dandelions, violets, milkweeds, and stuff I started eons ago? I had a perfect no-maintenance garden plan. <laughs> Those plants grow in any type of soil, withstand drought, and multiply with abandon. The nectar from the long-lasting blossoms attracts butterflies, honeybees, and flocks of songbirds. I expected to see a vast garden of colors by now, but all I see are these green rectangles. St. Francis. It's the tribes that settled there, Lord, the suburbanites. They started calling your flowers weeds and went to great lengths to kill them and replace them with grass. God, grass? It's so boring. It's not colorful. It doesn't attract butterflies, birds, and bees, only grubs and worms. It's sensitive to temperatures. Do these suburbanites really want all that grass growing there? Apparently so, Lord. They go to great pains to grow it and keep it green. They begin each spring by fertilizing grass and poisoning any other plant that crops up in the lawn. The spring rains and warm weather probably make grass grow really fast. That must make the suburbanites happy. Apparently not, Lord. As soon as the grass grows a little, they cut it, sometimes twice a week. <laughs> they cut it? Do they then bale it like hay? Not exactly, Lord. Most of them rake it up and put it in bags. They bag it? Why? Is it a cash crop? Do they sell it? No, sir, just the opposite. They pay to throw it away. Now, let me, let me get this straight. They fertilize grass so it will grow, and then when it does grow, they cut it off and pay to throw it away? Yes, sir. These suburbanites must be relieved in the summer when we cut back on the rain and turn up the heat. That surely slows the growth and saves them a lot of work. You aren't going to believe this, Lord. <laughs> when the grass stops growing so fast, they drag out hoses and pay more money to water it so they can continue to mow it and pay to get rid of it. <laughs> Nonsense. Well, at least they kept some of the trees. They, that was a sheer stroke of genius, if I do say so myself. The trees grow leaves in the spring and provide beauty and shade in the summer. In the autumn, they, they fall to the ground and form a natural blanket to keep moisture in the soil and protect the trees and bushes. It's a natural cycle of life. You better sit down, Lord. The suburbanites have drawn a new circle. As soon as the leaves fall, they rake them into great piles and pay to have them hauled away. No. What do they do to protect the shrub and tree roots in the winter to keep the, the soil moist and loose? After throwing away the leaves, they, they go out and buy something which they call mulch. They haul it home and spread it around in place of the leaves. And where do they get this mulch? They cut down trees and grind them up to make the mulch. Enough. I don't want to think about this anymore. St. Catherine, you're in charge of the arts. What movie do we have scheduled for us tonight? <laughs> Dumb and Dumber, Lord. It's, it's a story about... <clears throat> Never mind. I think I just heard the whole story from St. Francis.
This morning's Hebrew scripture reading is Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 9 and 15. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant or field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for our Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. And the human became a living being. And the Lord God planted an Eden, a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the human whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God may grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the human and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. The Gospel reading this morning is John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. So ends this morning's scripture readings. May God add a blessing of understanding to these words. In this morning's Gospel reading from John, we're landed in the midst of a longer discourse by Jesus about sheep, shepherds, and hired hands. The image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd is one that we're all familiar with. And I think that there's probably not a Sunday school in the world that doesn't have an image, a painting, a picture of gentle Jesus cradling a baby, baby little lamb, or Jesus with shepherd's crook, dramatic sky in the background, pastoral lands and sheep behind him. We're so familiar with this image. It's throughout the scriptures. The shepherd's crook is one of the accessories of the Catholic bishops. And the term pastor comes from this image. And what we do as ministers, what pastors do is pastoral care. And that all comes from this image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. Reading this passage, I'm immediately reminded of the parable of the lost sheep, which is found both in the Gospels of Matthew and in Luke. This is from Matthew. If a shepherd has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains? and go retrieve the one that went astray? If he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. And while the Christian scriptures are full of images of shepherds and sheep, 
The roots of these images are deeply embedded in the Hebrew scriptures. From Ezekiel. I will seek the lost, and I will bring, bring back the stray. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pastor, and I am your God, says the Lord God. And of course, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. These images are rich, and they reside deep in our Christian psyche. Even if we can't really name it outright, we as humans have been living for millennia off of the land, agricultural people. We have a deep understanding of this agricultural imagery. When scientists were trying to explain radio waves to the populace, they used an agricultural image, broadcast. It's how you scatter seeds. So I think that sometimes when we come against these images that are so familiar, we begin to tread a little bit on treacherous ground because we assume we really know what everything is talking about without really engaging our minds and thinking about it. In today's reading, you know, are we shepherds? Are we to be shepherds? Are we hired hands that are messing up? Or are we sheep? Well, we're sheep. <laughs> and in this context, Sheep are helpless. We need guidance. We stray. And when we stray, we can come, become victims of the wolf. I don't think as humans, and certainly not as Americans, we like to think of ourselves as helpless, as needing a shepherd. We're strong and independent, and we can do it ourselves. Well, isn't that just like a strayed sheep? Of course, the good shepherd in this context is Christ Jesus. But Jesus is more than that. Earlier in this sheep-shepherd discourse by Jesus, we are reminded that Christ is beyond our anthropocentric, our hyperhuman vision of God. Christ is the gate. Very truly, I tell you, Anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in another way, is a thief and a bandit. Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate. I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are, all who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever, whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pastor. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus sums it all up. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To come to God, we come to God through Christ's love, the gate, the way of life. We are guided by Christ, the Good Shepherd, to abide in that love within the sheepfold. So where does that leave us as sheep? And where is Christ for us now? As sheep, we're to follow, or we should. We're to emulate Jesus' relationship with God. Jesus follows God's command. And it's about more than following. And this whole passage is, is about love. It's motivated through love. The good shepherd, out of love for the sheep, lays down his life. And we learn of God's love for the shepherd. Biblical scholar Cheryl Lindsay has been writing recently a lot about the modern Christian obsession with the cross, as opposed to appreciating the empty tomb. So to phrase it another way, we're obsessed with the suffering of Christ, but not with the resurrection and transformation. And this passage does indeed talk about the shepherd laying down his life for the flock, but it also talks about taking it up again, and that's resurrection and transformation. She suggests that this passage is not so much about the cross as it is about God becoming human. 
what we like to call the incarnation. God laying down God's godness to walk, to suffer with us humans. God becoming human and walking with us. She writes, could the sacrifice asked of us to be to give up or transform a way of life that depends on the oppression and marginalization of others. I like this shift of perspective. Away from suffering and into transformation. If we focus too much on our suffering, I think we become victims of our own thinking. It's, it's limited. We focus on transformation, it's expansive. Transformation is how we live in God's abiding love. It's through God's abiding love that we become more and more transformed. Jesus, as the Good Shepherd, acts with intention, motivated by love for God and for the sheep. And that's our example, right? We're sheep and we're to follow. Which circles back to my earlier question, where is Christ for us now? And I believe that's an intentional, transformative acts of love. Not that transformative love doesn't involve sacrifice and isn't painful. Frequently, if not always, it does. Perhaps it requires that we lay down a comfortable part of our small self, our small ego. Or as Lindsay suggests, when Jesus asks us to lay down our lives, should he be asking us to exam examine our places of privilege? and lay them down. Laying down comfortable privilege. That's a sacrifice. Laying down a way of life that depends on oppression and marginalization of others. In our culture, that's a sacrifice. Just getting to the point of seeing and understanding our privilege is for many a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of our blind comfort. Laying down a way of life that depends on the abuse and the rape of the planet, that's a sacrifice. It's Earth Day Sunday, and when I look at this passage from John, the Good Shepherd, the Hired Hand, the Sheep, and I think about it in reference to the creation story in Genesis where God instructs the human to till and keep the garden, I feel that so many of us in middle white America are, if not the hired hand, we're the scattered sheep. We have the privilege to live as we want to. When the wolf of environmental destruction rears its ugly head, we can frequently ignore it. We can turn away. As long as we have gas for our cars and obscene quantities of food and landfills that we don't live near, we can remain comfortable, oblivious to the huge costs paid by the poor and marginalized, lands of indigenous people which are polluted and bulldozed, lead in the water of poor urban communities, communities living under heaps of our recycled garbage, oblivious to the costs paid by the earth and the creatures with whom we share it, gutted, poisoned earth, becomes toxic to life. Overpopulation and overuse of land, nature's encroached upon, leaving little room for our fellow creatures who become our adversaries in this war for space. Keeping and tilling the earth without intentional love has become use and abuse. So how do we lay down our privilege? How do we lay down our life and rejoin the fold? I think the answer is simple but difficult. We live into the abiding love of God. We act with intention, motivated and empowered by love for God, for all of creation. I am part of a, what they call a community of practice, and it's sponsored by the Vermont Conference of the United Church of Christ. All the participants, and I think there's like seven to nine of us, have all accepted.
accepted a call to ministry during COVID. Uh, taking on a ministry of a, in a pastoral sense, in, like a church like this, can be difficult in the best of times. During COVID, it's fairly, fairly challenging. Not really for me, because I think we've had an easy transition here at First Congregational. You guys have been very accommodating. Uh, but given the sort of typical nature of it, they've created this community of practice for us, and we share things. And our facilitator told us a story about a project that's happening in Philadelphia. And of course, Lane, our videographer, is from Philadelphia, and my ears pricked up. Uh, the information I'm about to talk to you about is from an article by Taylor Allen on the public broadcasting of Philadelphia, WHYY. And she talks about a principal in North Philadelphia who, after George Floyd's murder, wanted to do something to help her students. She's at Mary McLeod Elementary. And she says, I felt like I just could not breathe. I was thinking perhaps of building a garden, something that would bring new life into the environment. And that was one way that we could all collectively breathe again. So she decided to do just that. And she ended up starting a project in which 100 trees will be planted over the next two years on the campus of the school along and on its perimeters. 25 additional trees will be planted on the streets of the neighborhood. You see, in this neighborhood in North Philadelphia, they don't really have a tree canopy. It's concrete dominant. And this lack of a tree canopy leads to hotter temperatures. And the lack of tree canopy is also linked to a range of health issues, including asthma. I mean, we think about having houseplants in our houses, right? And they're air filters. So you have these children living in these hot, concrete places with no filter. A quarter of the students at Mary McLeod Elementary have asthma, and studies have shown that children who live in areas with more trees have a significantly lower prevalence of asthma. So where did we find Christ today? When I listen to this story, do we see Christ in the principal, the children, the trees? Is Christ the love that set this all in motion? I say yes to all of that. I am so inspired by this story. At its heart, love and justice. Move to action through love, correcting injustice at home for the health and well-being of her students. That is tilling and keeping, and that is how we get back to Eden. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is All Things Bright and Beautiful, verses 1 and 3 in the Pilgrim Hymnal 478.
correction, Blaine, you're not from Philadelphia itself, but you're from that area. So I, I just wanted to correct that. I didn't know whether that mattered. <laughs> Please join me in the spirit of prayer. O oh, Holy One, creator of all, lover of all creation, our hearts are full of wonder, still full of the hope of Easter and spring, yet we remain separated from each other, connected through your spirit. May we be reminded that you are always near, O oh God of peace. We ask for your help and guidance, O oh God, as we navigate our world. Open our eyes and give us new awareness. Help us to turn toward you, to work with justice and equality with loving and open hearts. Easter. Sure. 